Design Leader Insights is brought to you by Fuego UX. Fuego UX is a user experience consultancy focused on creating simple and intuitive digital experiences. Hey, hey Alistair, thanks so much for joining the show today. No worries. Thanks for having me, Alex. Appreciate it. Yeah, no doubt. And um, to get started, can you give the audience a bit of context in your journey in UX? I I didn't study design. Like I didn't study design back in college. I did a lot of psychology and consumer behavior. So why people do things in general? Like why do people buy things? Like what's the psychology behind that? And that kind of led into how I eventually got into, into design. But after university or college, as you call it in the US, I got rejected from a bunch of graduate jobs in London. And so instead of going straight into the world of work, I went traveling around the world and started in South and Central America, went to Australia, Southeast Asia, a bunch of places, and uh, and then ended up traveling for like two years. And, you know, I, I think we'll probably talk about this later on, but one of my first jobs was, you know, in a call center, all right, which was super interesting, learning how to talk and listen to people. Uh, but then, yeah, eventually found my way into my first design job where I was a design team of one. Uh, I did everything, branding, visual design, interaction design. Uh, I built my own usability testing lab using a, a piece of software called Moray, which at the time was like a huge investment of like $2,000. So it was like quite a big deal. But it was super interesting, like building my own little lab, having customers come in having engineers watch customers use our website and not being super impressed. <laughs> and uh, just that was my, you know, kind of induction into design and, and just, you know, building products, testing them really early with customers, building prototypes, shipping A-B tests. Um, and so that was that was how I started in design. And then, you know, eventually over the course of a num- almost two decades, I guess now, which is showing my age, like ending up at Dropbox as VP of design. That's awesome. So tell me about, Dropbox, um, that's a tool we use, um, Dropbox Sign at least. But yeah, tell me about that. Um, I feel like that's a company that went remote and is still remote, which is interesting to me as, as companies now shift back. But no. I know you might have been integral to that. So I'd love to hear about that. Instead of, I know that many companies, especially early on in the pandemic, they were you know wishing for the good old days in inverted commas to get back to the office. Dropbox took a very different approach and kudos to Drew and to Mel, our chief people officer, for really thinking that as seeing that as an opportunity. But they also invited me in to help leverage design thinking or human-centered design on how do you rethink work? Like if you're going to redesign work from scratch, how would you do that? And, you know, I quickly became the co-lead of what became our shift to remote work, which we called, we still call today virtual first. So it's not a hybrid right. model. It's not a co-located model. It's not a fully remote model. And I can talk about that in a second, but essentially I became the co-lead of this effort and I hired our first head of remote who built out a small little team and we approached it as a product almost with a human centered design mentality with our employees at the center of that experience. And so that's what I was doing for kind of two and a half years, like redesigning, rethinking work. And happy to talk more about that if you want to, Alex. What were those learnings of saying, you know, our team, This, these are the reasons why our team liked remote or virtual first, as you put sure. it. Or why do you think people are kind of like going back to the office when in 2023, all this technology enables to us to literally work from anywhere? Yeah. I mean, individual companies will have their own policies, right? And, right. you know, I always... So same as building a product, right? Like you're always prioritizing or optimizing for something and trading something else off, right? And and I think, you know, those companies are doing that because they believe their reasons are good for coming back to the office yeah. and, and they may well be. But focusing on us and our lessons, you know, we, from day one, we we had a few principles. One was to maintain a level playing field for our employees. And so for us, you know, hybrid doesn't necessarily necessitate a, a level playing field, right? If somebody's in the office versus has chosen to be remote, that's not necessarily a, a kind of level playing field. We also wanted to retain this kind of learning mindset. And so we said that whilst we were redesigning what we thought work looked like, we didn't know all of the answers. Like we didn't pretend to know all of the answers, but we said we would co-create and learn along the way with our employees. And we've, and we've done that. And, and the, the third was that we did believe that in real life or in-person collaboration and meeting was important, right? We recognize the need yeah. to actually get people together. And so having those principles in place, 
um, looking at what was going on in the market. So just competitive analysis of what's happening in, in remote work, who are very future forward kind of companies, companies like GitLab who are fully remote. You know, what can you yeah. learn from those different companies? We set out and also understanding well, what doesn't work about work today, right? And if you think about what doesn't work, it's that it's nine through five, yet our lives don't work nine through five, right? We have childcare pickup, or maybe we're a caregiver, or actually we're on a different side of the US. And so nine through five doesn't mean it's nine through five for me, right? So we set out with some early kind of hypothesis, just as you would as you're building a product. And one of the hypotheses was we believe we needed to build a non-linear workday. What that means in practice is we have a set of core collaboration hours. That's four hour time block. So for me on the West Coast, that's nine through one where I'm expected to be online for synchronous collaboration or to respond to Slack or email in a very timely manner, right? But outside of that 91, I'm encouraged to create my own non-linear workday, which means I can work and be productive when I feel like I'm going to be productive outside of my caregiver status or my kids, right? And so we encourage that as a practice at Dropbox. We learned, though, that employees wanted to change their habits, but they didn't know how. And so we did two very important things, which... One, we released something called the Virtual First Toolkit, which is public. Anybody can go use that. It's about 20 to 25 practices, which are kind of step-by-step guides to help people unlearn habits around, okay, how do I reduce my meetings? How do I not reflexively just schedule a meeting? Um, When should we have a meeting, right? When should we meet in person? So lots of different... um, tips and tricks and techniques for how to change your habits. So we released that to the company and also externally. The second thing that I think was important that we did was we we learned from this research that there were kind of five behavior changes that we were trying to adopt, right? And that, that one around meetings is important. So, and we shared these five behavior changes with our company and we said, this is what we're going from. And the from behavior was synchronous meetings all day. So that was what we were yeah. going from. Two, working asynchronous by default, right? How do you encourage this asynchronous first, right? Can I resolve this in an asynchronous way, whether that's by something like Dropbox Paper, Jira, Slack is even asynchronous, right? Can I resolve this asynchronous before I move to synchronous, right? Before I move to a kind of meeting. And so we had five different behaviors, but importantly, we shared that because we said, hey, 3,000 Dropbox employees, we're on a journey together about changing our behaviors this is where we want to get to. And these are some tactics. We had lots of different tactics and techniques for how to get there, but we said, this is where we're going and we want you to come on that journey with us. Alistair, I'm interested to to learn advice you may have for uh, new designers entering the field today. The, The job I had after college where I went traveling and then I ended up in Australia for a year and there was only, um, there was only really three jobs you could get in Australia on a, on a short-term visa. And it was either laboring. Uh, it was, you know, one of those people in the street selling, you know, trying to get people to sign up for charities, or it was working in a call center. I opted for the call center route. But what I learned from that experience was just the importance of active listening. So actually listening to what people are saying and then asking questions based on what they're saying to uncover information so that you can help either sell them a solution based on the problem that they have, or you can actually help them. Because when I was doing inbound customer service, you could actually diagnose the real problem they had so that you yeah. could then actually like help them. And so again, you know, translating that to design, Actually, the key thing for designers is to understand the real problem from a customer. So actively listening or the business, right? And then asking lots and lots of questions so that you really uncover the true need, not just like the surface level need. And then having the communication skill to be able to tell a story back about why, you know, if you're selling something, like why this thing is actually the right thing for to solve that problem or communicating in an empathetic way if that customer is angry or whatever they may be because they've got they've got a customer service issue but just the importance of communication and so i whenever i mentor people you know i you know for over probably 15 years this is the number one piece of advice i give them is just really hone your communication skills and in communication it's active listening and questioning yeah. 
as well as being able to present a solid argument. And there's a great book out there, The Psychology of Persuasion by Robert Cialdini, uh, and another one, um, Resonate by Nancy Duarte, which is The Art of Storytelling, which are two just, I think, excellent books to really understand the importance of psychology and then storytelling uh, in, you know, when you're communicating, trying to communicate something. And so that's the thing that I would totally advocate for people to, you know, any designer to go learn versus the heart, you know, the skills in Figma or Framer or whatever you're using. It's like, yeah, that they are important, but communication is critical in my mind. That's some interesting, maybe unconventional advice of like, Sales has a lot to teach you about communication in general, whatever your role is. So I love that. That's right. I mean, if people search, I've got a Medium article where I, I break down a popular sales technique, like framing technique, uh, and show how you can use that when you're presenting design work, because it's basically the same thing. It's like, what is the problem? You know, how do you uncover the need? What is the real yeah. need? Like, how do you then present your solution in a way? And then how do you close in a way that that seems like professional and is actually going to, you know, solve the problem in a really neat way? So, yeah, there's, it's, I don't know, as I said, I think it's critical. Yeah, there's an eerie overlap there that I think is awesome. Uh, thanks for sharing that. And thanks so much for coming on the show today. Frank, thanks to you for, for uh, having me on. And thanks to everyone for listening. 